I think we're actually live this time. I'm Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com, and welcome to another live video here on YouTube. And we'll see if we get this working. Should be coming through clearly. All right, making sure we're okay. Uh, so I'll give people a moment to come in. We should be live and working right now. Uh, but the reason I wanted to make this video is because I get really one question Actually, I get a lot of questions, but I get one particular question over and over and over again from students, and this is how can I actually speak fluently about many different kinds of things? Well, huddle. He do it all today. Uh, so a lot of people, uh, again, they can understand a lot of English, but they have trouble expressing themselves, and especially if the topic is new or unfamiliar or something, uh, then they have trouble being able to speak. Uh, so I wanted to talk about this because in a video I did uh, a couple of, I think, what was that, last week I did on Instagram, uh, I spoke with a few learners. Uh, and uh, one of them in particular was talking about how she's reading lots of books and taking time to improve her English, uh, but she doesn't feel like she's actually becoming more fluent. And so fluency, again, just to make this very clear for people, this is how well you can communicate. It's not how much you know. And we know this because often little children, like, you know, four, five, six-year-old kids, native English-speaking kids, can communicate better than many adult English learners. And so the, the, the goal is not to uh, just try to learn more and more and spend more time learning. What you really should be doing is actually focusing on vocabulary because this is how people get fluent. It's how you got fluent in your native language. It's how you develop mastery in anything. Uh, so I had a couple of notes Actually, uh, there are quite a few things I want to talk about. <laughs> All right, so we got, let's see here. Hopefully, muted is Hopefully, the, hopefully the, uh, the volume is loud enough, too. Let's see. Uh, welcome from Germany. Nice to see everybody. I want to be quick, go through a couple of different examples about this just to make the point about how you can actually speak fluently about almost anything. Uh, but also just to let you know, this is not like an instantaneous process, uh, but it really actually does happen quite quickly if you start doing the right thing. So that's what we'll talk about in this video. Uh, so I wanted to talk about this again. I mentioned the learner at the beginning, uh, but also just because I really want to show how natives are learning and remind you about how you learned your native language. So I had my, uh, actually before I do that, let me give you a quick, a quick example of something uh, just to kind of contrast these two ways of learning. So the typical, uh, we'll just call this the, uh, the ESL approach. So this is English as a second language, and then we have the EFL approach over here, which is learning English as a first language. And what most people do is they spend a lot of time trying to learn as much vocabulary as possible. So imagine each one of these is a new phrase. So if you spend today trying to learn 10 new phrases or 10 new words or whatever, uh, the EFL approach, really, you're trying to focus on one thing and, and learn it very deeply. Okay, this is basically the simplest contrast between these things. So children, they will often be learning something like a child will watch the same movie, you know, a hundred times. So they are, they are just naturally getting uh, lots and lots of review while uh, most English learners uh, are trying to just, and again, this is, it's not really the fault of learners. Part of it is your brain just trying to get you to learn new things, and part of it is teachers that are really not spending enough time focusing on things. Uh, and so they will learn something new, and they will learn another new thing, and then they will forget other things that, uh, that they thought they knew. So before I talk about uh, exactly what you should be doing and give you some examples of this, uh, I thought it would be interesting to just use a brick example to get you all thinking about something very simple like a brick. So just imagine I have a brick right here. Uh, I want you to write down in the comments right now, just think of how many different ways you can use a brick. All right, so very simple object. You could do the same thing with a marker or you know, an eraser or something like that. But how many different things could you do with a brick? All right. 
<coughs> this will help you get thinking more like a native speaker about vocabulary because what we want to do is get you focusing on something rather than trying to, you know, we, we look at one way a brick could be used and then we go to some other object. All right, so ARC just popping in. Look at that. Keep up the good work. Here we go. Uh, so yeah, everyone, take your take your time and uh, and give me just any kind of use. You can put it right in the chat. How could you use a brick? All right. Just think. Try to try to be a little bit of creative. You can think about this as a, a creativity. Uh, let's see. You could build something. Okay. So even if we have only one brick, I mean, obviously, if we had many bricks, we could probably build a wall. But yeah, we could build something. We could make something. That's true. It could be the uh, like the first piece uh, of a wall. Uh, we could throw it for sure. <laughs> you could use it as a weapon if you wanted to throw it as something. Yeah, it could be a bridge. Yeah, maybe like a, even a bridge, a small bridge for a mouse or something like that. So if we put, I don't know, something under here and then we have our brick like that, it could be a little bridge over some, some water, something like that. So we could probably think of, I don't know, 30, 40 different uses as a supporter, sure. So you could put something on top of it. You could sit on it, that's right. You could use it as a chair, very good. Uh, so we could also, so again, we could put things on top of it or we could put the brick on other things, like using it as a paperweight, a paperweight. So things, maybe if it's a windy day, we put the brick on paper to stop it from blowing away. I don't know, maybe we throw it in some water to make a loud splash just to hear the sound of that. All right. I don't want to spend too much time uh, in the video going over all the different ways you could use a brick. Uh, but the point is, if you think a little bit about it, you spend just a little bit of time thinking, you can probably uh, think of some pretty creative uses for a brick. Okay. And then we also have maybe there, we could have different kinds of bricks. You could have like a Lego brick where you're... You know, you got your little pieces in there, you're connecting it to something. Or it could be uh, maybe made out of plastic or something, a different kind of brick. Or it could be a different color, maybe you just use it as a decoration or something. All right, so why am I bringing up this example? Uh, the point of this is really just to show you the difference between what learners are doing, so what teachers are usually doing in classes, and what natives are doing, all right? So I was walking, uh, walking my older daughter, Aria, to school today. And uh, while we were walking, she said, Dad, what does harsh mean? Harsh. The word harsh. All right. Let's see. Do you think pay attention at native English mouth can help you with pronunciation? Yes, if you, obviously, if you're, if you're watching what people do, but listening is more important. <coughs> and it's better to listen to like 10 different people speaking than to try to watch one person's mouth, if that makes sense. So Aria, my older daughter, asks, what does harsh mean? Uh, and I said, oh, where did you hear that? And she said, oh, I was watching a show, Boss Baby. Maybe you've heard of this show, Boss Baby. So there are actually uh, a lot of complicated words and expressions. It's really a show for adults, but because it's a cartoon, kids like to watch it. Uh, but she's learning lots of interesting vocabulary, and so one of the words uh, that she learned was harsh. Uh, so she's asked, uh, what's harsh mean? Uh, and so I said, okay, where did you hear that? You're watching Boss Baby. What's happening in the scene or in the show when you hear something uh, or someone use the word harsh? So I, I think uh, like one character, and these are, I don't know, babies or whatever. I, I, didn't, I didn't see the show, but but just listening to her talk about it. So one character uh, is, is kind of like yelling at, yelling at this other character. Maybe we'll, we'll give him like an angry face. Uh, and the other character says like, don't be, be so harsh. So this is one example of this. So don't be so harsh. So what's happening here is, okay, if we, we imagine the scene, we can think about one character as being angry at another character, uh, and they're saying some, some harsh words, some harsh words to the other character. Uh, and you can start to understand what harsh means, or kind of one, one example of what harsh means. But after she, she kind of understood this, it's like, okay, it's maybe kind of something maybe a little bit mean or something difficult 
uh, or something hard, hard to hard to deal with, something hard to accept, something that's harsh like that. Uh, but I didn't stop here. As we're walking to school, I start giving her more examples of harsh. And so you might have, we'll just put some more examples up here. Here, I'll just leave this. So we might have some harsh, some harsh weather. Now, if you think about it, okay, we understand this meaning of harsh, then if we have harsh weather, do you think that's like good, pleasant weather? or maybe not good, pleasant weather. <laughs> and, and a child can imagine, oh wow, that looks like there will be some harsh, harsh weather today. There's a snowstorm and lots of wind. So that's what we mean by harsh weather, harsh weather. All right, so you might have a harsh storm or we could have a harsh season. Again, we're still talking about similar kinds of things here. Uh, but again, the point is that we don't stop with just one example of something. We really want to make sure that you can understand that vocabulary very well. So when I'm teaching my own kids, we spend time with the vocabulary. Yeah, so bad weather, again, harsh weather, the same kind of thing. And you understand it from the situation, from the context, rather than trying to get a definition or a translation of the word. So this is why I asked my daughter, uh, like, when did you hear that? What situation? What's happening to those characters when they say that? Because I want her to be thinking about that when she's learning new things. Again, it's going to be much easier for her to understand new vocabulary this way. So we got harsh weather, uh, harsh storm, harsh conditions. All these things, they mean something that's difficult or it's going to be bad. And again, we already have the example of harsh words. Someone might use some harsh language. Maybe they're cursing at someone, they're angry at someone. Does this make sense? Is it, is it starting to be a little bit more clear what harsh means? You've probably heard this word before, but have you heard all these different uses of it? Maybe, maybe not. But this is usually uh, what natives are doing. So they don't learn, like, I, I'm, I'm actually very efficient about how I teach my kids because I understand how they should be learning. But usually what children do is they will hear maybe one example of something and then it could be weeks or months later they hear another one and they make that connection. So I want to help my kids make that connection as fast as possible. Like look at that, here's something harsh, here's another thing that's harsh. These are all different harsh examples so they understand very well what it means, okay? So this is just one example, but I wanted to give some more, uh, especially kind of higher level things. But uh, remember, just because the, the, vo the vocabulary looks simple, you might have a word like harsh, and it seems like a short, simple word. Uh, like, okay, that's not a, an advanced word. But again, in, an, in a real conversation, would you be able to use harsh in these different ways? Would that vocabulary come to your mind automatically? If you learn this way, it does. So if you can think, wow, like harsh, uh, and, and now because I have this word and because I know it so well, I've gone deep into the vocabulary. We're going to focus on something rather than trying to learn a bunch of different things. So remember the traditional ESL approach, we have a lesson, I try to teach you 10 or 20 words or something, but we're not going to go very deeply or spend much time on them, and then next week, there's no review of any of that vocabulary. So you're learning a few things uh, and then you don't spend time reviewing them. But with the EFL approach, we really wanna take something and go deep into that vocabulary. So we learn the word harsh and then we want to hear lots of different examples of how the word might be used. And it's all of these examples that really make you fluent in that vocabulary, all right? Now here's the amazing part about this. Now that you do this with one word, you can use this word when you're talking about other things. Like, don't judge me so harshly. So people are being critical. They are criticizing you. Hey, like, you know, this is a bad presentation or something. Like, wow, whoa, don't, don't be so harsh. Please give me some kind, helpful feedback, okay? So again, it's another example of like harsh feedback, harsh words, harsh language, and this is just one example. Okay, so when I'm teaching my kids, this is what I'm trying to do. I don't want to give them a definition of the word. I want to help them understand really what it means by covering lots of different things. 
Does this make sense? Let me know in the comments if this is like, yeah, so rough, another idea. And these are all kind of similar because often words don't have maybe one definition or the definition might be broad. So it could cover many different things. But in this way, uh, my daughter Aria now understands, ah, okay, harsh means something difficult. Wow, that test was really harsh. Well, that was a difficult, a difficult thing, okay? <clears throat> so the point here is, uh, if you want to be able to speak fluently about almost anything, the, 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 you actually should do the opposite of what most people think. So the English as a second language approach says, uh, if we try to learn all these different vocabulary words, let's say we have like a thousand, thousand word vocabulary. Uh, and if we, if we try to learn a whole bunch of words or try to learn more words than that, then we can talk about anything. But what happens, is that they don't actually know very well the vocabulary, and so they actually can't have conversations about anything. They can have a very limited conversation about some things. But the, uh, the EFL approach, the English as a first language approach, what we're doing is really trying to help you understand something very well, and then you can move on to the next thing. So once you feel confident about this, then you move on to the next word or phrase or whatever. Uh, but because you know this so well, now you can use it when talking about everything. You can use it when talking about relationships or going to the doctor or whatever. You now know that vocabulary and you can use it when you're talking about almost anything. Okay? So the point is not to know every word. The point is to know like the vocabulary that you have very well. And the better you know it, this is how you do it. So you're getting lots more examples. You're really trying to understand something very well. Hopefully this is making sense. Let me know in the, in the comments if everybody is getting this uh, before I move on to some additional vocabulary for this. All right, yes, you could have some harsh parents, that's true. Uh, let's see, Alfonso asks, so I just want to know if it is possible, uh, S.O. who is fluent in English, be able to express one's thought on all topic. Yeah, but do you see how this works? So now that I know the word harsh, I understand how I can apply it in different topics, okay? So if I just learn the word harsh and a definition, maybe I'm only thinking about harsh weather, all right? But actually, harsh doesn't, it doesn't only mean weather. That's not, harsh doesn't mean that. It's meaning, like, as you look at all these different examples, you can understand that, what that means. Yeah. <laughs> yes, use your English though. Use your English. <laughs> I was just watching that this morning. <laughs> That's from a, a Japanese TV show called Hanakappa. Uh, if, if I'm talking about the same, if we're talking about the same thing. Uh, but yes, that, that's kind of a harsh name over there. All right. <laughs> All right, hopefully this makes sense though. Uh, so the idea again is to focus on something to understand it very well, and that's how you can use it to talk about lots of different topics. So you can use this vocabulary and other things. All right, let me give you two more examples uh, of something. So this is just a single word, but I thought I would also give you uh, two other ones. I know learners love phrasal verbs, so we will talk about that very quickly. Phrasal verbs are things that uh, young kids learn when they're trying to understand uh, more complicated things than just a single verb like stand. We might have stand up or we might have sit down or sit up. So again, we're not just, we're not just looking at sit because we have sit, we might have sit down and we also have sit up. So sitting down just means to sit down in a chair, uh, but sit up means actually to have correct posture when you're sitting, all right, to sit up. Uh, but let's just give another example of bring up. Now, usually when kids are learning these things for the first time, they will hear somebody using a physical, visual example of something. So if I say, oh, I might bring up, like if I bring up a marker, I'm going to raise something up. So if I'm maybe walking from uh, the first floor in my house, we're gonna draw a house here. 
it's got two floors in it and then here's some stairs. Uh, so if I walk from here up to the second floor and I'm carrying something with me, I'm bringing up a, like a thing. I, I might bring up a marker from the first floor, all right, to bring something up. All right. Yes. All right. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> Very good, Mina. Uh, but again, this, this same idea, we begin with something physical that you can see, and this is how kids are able to understand the vocabulary without using translations. All right. So we're going to physically bring something. So pull it from one place to another to bring it up. Bring it up. All right. And so we might have another thing. So we've got another example. If we imagine a conversation, two people are talking about something. So here's one person and another person talking. Uh, and the first one says, oh, like I had an idea about something. Uh, and they're, they're just introducing that in the conversation. So that person might bring up, bring up a topic. So again, you're, you're kind of imagining if it's like inside your head and you, you bring it up to the, to the topic, you know, bring it up to the conversation. It's a similar idea of carrying something from one lower level to a higher level. So if you bring up a conversation, oh, my friend just brought that up in a conversation. So we were talking about something and my friend brought up, I don't know, some idea about that. What we kind of mean is they're bringing something maybe from their mind or from the inside of their head and now they're making it uh, obvious, okay? Bring up your date. Yes, and so another example, another uh, very common one is like to bring up a child, to bring up a child. So if you bring up a child, same kind of idea. Oh no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sneeze. Uh, oh no, it went away. Maybe it'll come back. <laughs> so if we bring up a child, we can think about that child physically getting bigger over time. So they're bringing, we're bringing them up. We're trying to raise them up, trying to help them grow, to bring up a child, all right? So all of these examples, the ESL approach would be, okay, we're going to bring up and then maybe they would learn one example of something. But the EFL approach is really to help you understand the vocabulary very well. All right, does that make sense? So the, the thing that's really stopping people from communicating, uh, it's not their vocabulary. Again, you might have uh, like a child that knows 100 words uh, and an adult that knows 1,000 words, but the better communicator will be the one who knows that vocabulary really well. All right. So me speaking Japanese in the same way, like my my Japanese vocabulary is I don't know how many words I know in Japanese. I know I actually I can't even count how many words that would be, but I have no trouble communicating in different situations about different topics. OK, so confidence is a key factor. Yes, confidence is key, but confidence comes from your understanding of vocabulary. So you don't, you don't just magically become confident for no reason. You become confident because you think, ah, okay, now I get it. Now I really understand what's happening. I really understand the vocabulary. Okay? I'll go back, take a look at a few comments, and then I'll give a final example here. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. All right, Chris says, I like your way of teaching from India. Glad to hear it. Uh, why Native people use this, like going, doing? It's just to be faster. So they're speaking uh, faster English. Sheehan says, where are you from? I'm from the United States. Uh, that makes sense means I heard in lots of movies. Yeah, so that makes sense. To make sense means to be understood. So if I say, oh, am I, am I being understood? Do you understand what I'm saying? I can say, does that make sense? So am I, am I talking something up? Yeah, bringing up a ball. So that usually like if you're like playing basketball or something, it's again, bringing something like forward down the court to bring something up, all right? But again, the point is that you're spending more time with fewer words. So it's, it's like you're learning less, okay? I know people are, they really wanna learn more and like here's how to have, uh, a massive vocabulary, but you don't get there uh, for speaking unless you actually spend time with the vocabulary. But it's, it's new for your mind as you're learning these different examples, just like we talked about with Harsh. 
All right, so I'm going to teach a new phrase. Maybe some people know this already, maybe some people do not. Uh, but this is the same way I would explain it to my own kids. And again, this is important. Really want to help people understand it the same way natives do. All right, Zora says, uh, bring up something that happened in the past. Yep, yeah, exactly. So something in the past, you might bring that up as well. All right. And as you feel more confident about the vocabulary, then you will feel uh, much more comfortable in a conversation using it. All right. So we're going to draw a tree here for this last expression. Then I'll take more questions uh, if we have them. So here's uh, my, this is supposed to be a tree. I can draw a tree okay. Um, and so each one of these things, we can call this a branch uh, or a limb. This is a silent B, a limb. So a branch of a tree or a limb of a tree. Now, if you look at this, if I climb up, some of these branches are going to be stronger than others. So maybe I will, uh, I could, if I stand like on a, on a very strong branch up here, I know I am safe, I will be supported. But if I'm out here, if I try to stand up out here, do you think that's, that's is that safe or not safe? <laughs> and again, I, I, this is the same way I would teach it to my own kids just to make sure it's understandable. So if I'm standing up here, on a very strong, big limb, then it will probably be pretty safe. I will not fall from there. But if I try to stand out here, do you think that would be safe or not? Now, forgive me if this seems like an easy question, but I'm trying to get you to think like a native as I do this. So let me know in the comments. All right, bring down, is that possible? Yes, so that's another example. You can bring something down as well. So you bring something up, you bring something down. And you would also learn different expressions like, uh, like another person is, uh, maybe you make them feel bad. So if I'm depressed uh, and I'm talking with my friend, like I can bring him down too. I can bring him down to my level. Yeah, you, you, you can improve your English. If you understand what I'm saying, you can, you can improve. <laughs> All right. So I can't create a sentence while speaking. What should I do? So yes, this is the point. The point is about getting lots of input to help you really understand uh, the vocabulary. So we have the person up here. It's a very strong branch or a strong limb. And out here, very weak because uh, the person is too heavy. Maybe they will fall, fall down. All right, so here's where we get the expression to go out on a limb. What do you think that means? To go out on a limb. So to go out on a limb. What do you think that means? Try to think about it like a native English speaker. To go out on a limb. I'll give you a moment to try to uh, give me even a simple explanation of what that means. Not safe. Okay. Anyone else? Just post it right here in the comments. Uh, is it possible to improve my English by listening to something that I don't even understand? Uh, probably not. Uh, I would not, I don't know, if, you, if, you don't, if you're just listening to something you can't understand any, at all, you're probably wasting your time, other than hearing maybe how the sound of the language is. Uh, let's see, so dangerous, awful, very good, very good. And how to motivate low achievers to speak English? Well, you just make the language easy. That's it. If you make the language difficult, people don't want to learn. If you make the language easy, then people want to learn. It's really that simple. All right. Something that's not saved. Do you think shadowing is a good way to learn a new language? Uh, it's not really the best use of your time. Not reliable? Yeah. Ugh. Writing very sloppily here, not reliable. All right, so yes, the idea here to go out on a limb, really it means to do something risky that's not safe. Yes, it could put you in a dangerous position, all right? But you can understand physically how this works. So you can imagine a person, again, this is the same way I would teach my own kids. I would actually draw something like this. If they say, Dad, what does it mean to go out on a limb? To go out on a limb. So I have to explain what a limb is and talking about they're, they're kind of like going out further and further. So they're not just standing here next to the tree where it's safe. They're really going out and, and going much, much further. They're going out on 
a limb. All right, so you can understand what this means from the picture. All right, and that's why people have given some good examples over here of what it means. Okay, so we've got something that's not safe, dangerous, not reliable. Yes, there's probably going to be some issue or something wrong that will happen. It's risky. Okay, so where do you think we might use this expression now? So we take a physical thing like this, we understand what it means, uh, as many expressions can be understood this way. When do you think someone might use this? So yes, visual, visual examples are key if you can understand them, especially if you understand, okay, what is a limb? So often if you, if you begin with trying to teach people an expression like this, if you just translate this whole thing into somebody, somebody else's language, you're not really teaching them anything. You're not actually helping them understand the language like a native speaker. So that's why, again, in the English as a first language approach, we really want to help you understand everything so you can really feel confident using it. A newbie, does it literally mean a beginner? Yes, like a new person who's doing something. Yeah. So an unsafe situation like what? Be specific, mean a very good. So think about uh, when you might use this. When might someone go out on a limb? All right, uh, do you have more videos about minimal pairs? Actually, uh, I don't think I have. I have some videos that cover that, but I would recommend uh, if you just, if you wanna compare different sounds in that way, uh, get Frederick. So you can click on the link in the description below this video, uh, but rather than having a video of that, you can actually go back uh, and test that out. Oh, Aria Ginkyo. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So what are some habits? All right, we're going to go back to that kind of stuff in a minute. All right. Do you have some vids about pronunciation? Yes. Uh, again, uh, if, you, if you just search our YouTube channel for pronunciation and also get Frederick as well, that will improve your pronunciation as well. <clears throat> All right. So if we imagine this situation, everybody understands this is something risky. A person is doing something maybe they should not do for themselves. So maybe I go out on a limb. Uh, I'll see if I can fit all this in here. So I went out. So I went out on a limb to help someone. So again, I did something risky to help somebody else. Now I'm not actually in a tree uh, in the example. Uh, maybe I went out, uh, I don't know, like I had, to, I had to go out and swim in some, some shark infested water. So sharks, lots of sharks in the water and I had to go out and try to save somebody. So I went out on a limb to help them. Or I went out on a limb uh, to create a new, uh, like a, try to create a new product at work. So it was a, a risky thing to do. Maybe, maybe not many people will buy the product or something wrong will happen to it. It's risky, all right, to go out on a limb, all right? Now watch, we're gonna take it to an even higher level, but I want to make sure everybody understands this as it is, all right? It's just another way of saying to do something risky, to do something dangerous, do something that maybe uh, like if I'm if I if I'm talking about like a friend of mine at work and I say some good things about him, uh, even though he maybe did something I don't know not so good at work or something like that. So I'm going out on a limb to say something nice about that guy. So I could get in trouble for that, or I could lose my job or something. All right, so I'm going out on a limb. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. So you could you could like to, to talk about like investing in a stock or something. So I, I went out on a limb to to try to try doing something like that, to try uh, investing in something. All right. <clears throat> and so it could mean something that's like actually dangerous uh, or it, it just means like a kind of risk in a in a certain way like this. Is this session devoted just for teaching idioms? No, this is this is one one example this isn't i mean you really wouldn't call this an idiom it's really just like and, and and an idiom is typically something that you can't understand from the words this is usually like this is to go out on a limb is a thing that you can usually understand like natives would understand what that means uh physically in this way but some things are more difficult to understand uh so some people might call this an idiom but this is an easier one 
Uh, but the point is I want to show that, number one, you should be understanding it and spending more time with it um, as a native. Uh, so in the same way that we don't want to just get a definition or a translation of the word, we really want to help you understand it like a native so you feel confident about using it, all right? And that means you're getting lots and lots of examples of something, you really understand it well, and again, that's how you be, uh, become fluent. And, and when you become fluent in this, like if I know how to use uh, to go out on a limb, then I can start talking about that in lots of different situations. So if we take it to an even higher level, Let's imagine uh, we have a kid. So he's got he's got like a, a hat on backwards. Uh, actually, I just drew a face on his hat. <laughs> Put his face on his face. Uh, he's got some kind of baggy clothes here, uh, and he's uh, I don't know some baggy baggy pants and. He looks like he has a picture of a skateboard on his shirt. Now I might say when I meet this kid, I'm like, I'll go out on a limb. Like I might be going out on a limb, but do you like skateboarding? <laughs> All right. So I'm going, or you could say, I'll, I'll go out on a limb as even, even easier way to think about this. So I'll go out on a limb and say like skateboarding. So I'll go out on a limb and say or I'll go out on a limb and guess you like skateboarding. So here I'm using the expression ironically. So there's I'm not actually talking about risk at all because like I can look at him and, and, and guess like it's probably, you know, like he probably likes skateboarding. <laughs> he looks like a skateboarder, has a skateboarding shirt on, maybe he's at a skate park. And I say, oh, like I'll go out on a limb and say you probably like skateboarding. All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm using the expression in an ironic way, all right? And so I, if, I, if I mean it in a serious way, I might say, I'm going to go out on a limb, but I bet you like stock investing. So there I'm actually, I'm saying something that like, it's not really risky, like for my personal health or something, but it, it sounds like a, there's, there's no, no real reason why it should be true. Just looking at him. So if I say, I'll go out on a limb, I'll go out on a limb and say, uh, you look like you invest in stocks. <laughs> And so it's a funny thing to look at that and think, maybe he does. Maybe this kid likes investing in stocks. But judging by the way he looks, like he doesn't, you know, he should have like, you know, maybe uh, like a stock, like ticker or something on his shirt. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, maybe, maybe some other things like that. He's got a tie on. Uh, he's carrying, I don't know, a briefcase. He's got some charts in his hand, something like that. All right. So whenever you have uh, a situation like this where you're you want to use it in an ironic way, you can use it in the same way. All right. Now, I don't expect you to remember all of this and try to use it confidently today. The point is that if you spend time with vocabulary uh, and maybe the next day you review this again and another day you review it again and you hear it in different ways, that's when you start feeling confident. And then you can use that expression in lots of different ways. All right. Let's see. So, Abraham, uh, yeah. So we have a whole a whole app about about it covers everything about phonics. Just get Frederick. It's already done and waiting for you. So you don't need a video about phonics. Uh, we have a video series on YouTube about that already. Uh, and yeah, just get Frederick by clicking on the link in the description below this video. All right. So we've covered a few different things in this video, and each of them are examples of how you spend more time learning something so you really understand it, and then that's how you can use it in different situations. I'll give you uh, an example in Japanese. Uh, so for me, like uh, a joke that I learned, like did something I use all the time, and I have to remember, like, did I use that joke in front of this person, or I can't say it in front of my wife because she's already heard me use it so many times. Uh, but in different situations, I will say, I bet uh, 
All right, so this is just the English translation of uh, the Japanese is like Shine Waribiki, which is like an employee discount. Uh, so let's say I see a friend of mine. Uh, this happened to me uh, a couple of days ago. So this friend of mine is a doctor, uh, and he has <laughs> uh, he had like a like a cut on his eye. Uh, and I said, oh, like, but it's, you know, you don't have to pay for medical bills, like, because you're a doctor, you know, like, I bet, I bet you get an employee discount. <laughs> uh, or like a friend of mine, another friend of mine, he was, uh, I think he was like cutting his own kid's hair. So he's a barber, but he's cutting his own child's hair at home. And I was like, ooh, like that child gets an em employee discount. All right, but I can use this because I'm like very confident about this particular expression. I can use that in lots of different situations. And pretty much any time I could be speaking about anything and would, would be able to find a way to use that. All right, so I, I didn't just like memorize this. I really understood what it means and then I can use it in a fluent way in different situations. All right. So this video is not about how to learn like one word uh, and now you can speak fluently about everything. The point is that you will build up very quickly uh, the ability to communicate if you learn in this way. All right. All right. So let me go back, answer questions. Uh, it's been about 40 minutes. Let's see here if I missed anybody. Yes, I went out on a limb and spent all my money. Yes, so that would be like going out on a serious limb right there. Uh, and you will learn, uh, very good, Mina. Also, um, you will learn the nuances of expressions like this as you hear more people use them. All right, so to go out on a limb and you also uh, improve your understanding of tenses because you're learning like to go out on a limb or she went out on a limb or she would be going out on a limb, that kind of thing. Uh, as you're hearing these different examples. This is all just naturally varied review. Uh, what does it mean to come out of the woodwork? What does it mean to come out of the woodwork? All right, we, we'll give one more example, Alfonso, because uh, that's a good one and that goes along with what we're talking about here. So if we use that last expression here uh, to come out of the woodwork. All right, so if we imagine like a piece of you know, wood or something like that, the woodwork usually refers to uh, like the pieces of wood or you might have a door or uh, you know, some nice like design, something like that. Uh, I, don't, I'm gonna, I don't wanna move the camera because it's gonna mess up the video, uh, but let's say we have like a lovely piece of, I don't know, there's like a column with little, little other I don't know, fancy spirals and things like that. So this is the woodwork uh, in a building or in a room, the woodwork. And so we talk about like things are coming out of the woodwork. Imagine if there's like a design of, I don't know, like a person uh, or some kind of animal. We have, I don't know, like a, a dog or something like that. So if we have pictures of things that are carved into the wood, so into the woodwork, we've got some lots of interesting designs. Uh, but suddenly, all of these things, they, they become real and they come out of the woodwork and oh now, now we've got like a dog here and, a, and another animal and other things over here. So things are coming out of the woodwork. It just means like, imagine you're in a room and suddenly you're getting lots of examples of all these things, something like that. Um, so another example might be, uh, let's say if I'm, uh, I'm in a room uh, and there are a bunch of people sitting and listening to me talk. And I say, oh, no, I have a problem. Uh, does anyone have, uh, I, I, need, I need like medical help. And all of these doctors start coming out of the woodwork. So people I didn't know, they were doctors. They're just people sitting in a room and, and they all are like, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm a doctor, I'm a doctor. They're coming out of the woodwork. So it's if you imagine a situation where uh, something is, it just seems like normal and, and every day and you don't really think much about it. But suddenly, all of these things appear at the same time. So it's like they're coming out of the woodwork. They're coming out of the woodwork. All right. Let me know if that, if that makes sense. All right. Uh, so something that is typically different from the actual words. Yes, so that's more of an idiom. Uh, so me and you, hello, sir. Uh, it is going always. I like to learn uh, a bit 
maybe you mean a bit about phrasal verbs. Thank you, Drew. The lessons are really valuable for us. Glad to hear it. Alfonso, again, I'm struggling to express my expressing my thought in English. Would you mind telling me the secret to overcoming it? That's it. This is the whole the whole video is about that. All right. So when we're we're talking about how you become more fluent, you become more fluent by understanding the vocabulary better. Okay, it's not about practicing repeating phrases. I don't become fluent. I would not say, okay, now I want you to repeat, come out of the woodwork, come out of the woodwork. You, you don't get fluent in the vocabulary by repeating it. You get fluent by hearing lots more examples of, of how it's used. So that way you feel very confident about using it yourself. Uh, da, 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 I'm a dead loss when it comes to drawing on the board. <laughs> yes, I could probably draw nicer than this, maybe. Uh, but I'm trying to be quick. That's why I'm drawing it like that. Uh, bro, I think your drawings are not, uh, I think your drawings are not as mine. Like, not as good? Yeah, maybe not, I bet. I go out of limb and guess you like me. Yes, so you could say that. Like, I could go out of limb and guess you like me. Let's see. Let's see. Yes, we, I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to eat it. <laughs> so just asking if I'm like not, not coming to the park. Uh, but yes, drop some vids about phonics. Yes, hey there, good to hear you. You're getting old, says Noel. Really? Getting older? I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's what happens as time goes by. Yeah, we get older. Hopefully I'm, not, I'm still, still all right. You know, I'm not, not too tired. All right, uh, digis, digis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, digis, hey, my listening is very good. I can understand most of what they say, but when I want to speak, it's hard to create sentences. What do you recommend for me for improving my speaking? This is it. The, the exact thing I'm talking about in this video is how you get there. All right. So you get there by uh, understanding the vocabulary better. So what's great about this, the English as a first language approach, is you don't have to go anywhere, you don't have to speak with anyone, you just have to get more of this input. All right? So just like I'm, I'm giving you one example of harsh, you don't stop with one example. You get many examples of harsh, uh, and that will help you use the word and remember the word so you feel very confident about using it in your conversations. <coughs> All right. So yes, that, that is the, that is the whole the whole secret here. Monday morning live class become a good habit. Thanks no end. Uh, my pleasure, Ilda. Your kids are getting a teacher's discount. Bam! You got it. Yes, my children get an employee discount. My my kids get an employee discount. So that's a perfect usage of that same expression. Very good. Do you think uh, grammar is important in speaking? Yes, it's the most important thing. Become alive, get alive. Hi, sir. Today is my daughter's birthday. Could you call her name? She'll be very happy. I'll tell her her name uh, in your live stream. Her name is Baran. If I'm pronouncing it correctly, Baran, Baran. Happy birthday. <laughs> All right, how to use VOC, what, uh, VOC in context, uh, to use VOC. Yes, you want to learn it in context, yes. All right, I'm going to be okay. Mina again says, I come out of the woodwork and carved a beautiful tree. Yeah, in that case, you would, like, Unless you are kind of like hiding somewhere, like I came out of the woodwork. Also, the, the idea, and, and this is one of those things, you get better at understanding the vocabulary as you hear more examples of it. So typically, things are coming out of the woodwork like, like lots of examples of something at the same time. All right, so if we have a bunch of things are hidden and they all appear at the same time, they are coming out of the woodwork. So it's like they were there all the time, but nobody noticed them, all right? So in my example about having many doctors in a room, ah, they're all coming out of the woodwork. So it wouldn't be just like, we wouldn't really talk about one thing coming out of the woodwork. It's usually like, I mean, imagine, uh, like something in woodwork, it would be like, you know, some patterns of something. We would have many examples of that. So it would be more than one thing. Uh, let's see. So to more listening and speaking. Yes. Let's see. Yeah, you got food poisoning. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Great job. Hi, everyone from Turkey. Greetings from Morocco. See if we get anybody else. Greetings from Mexico. Yes, we got people from all over the place. Nice to see everybody in Tsubasa there. All right, does this make sense? 
Does everybody understand what I'm getting at here? What is, what is the point of my message today? <laughs> what, I want to make sure everybody understands what I'm talking about. And yes, uh, and then happy birthday to Baron as well. What's about us from Yokohama? Uh, let's see, future hope. A kid asks his dad, what's a man that does is a man is someone who is responsible and cares for his family. The kid says, I hope one day I can be a man just like mom. <laughs> Yes, that's something, something you would probably hear in, uh, in more conversations uh, in this day and age, interestingly. <clears throat> All right, to make this very clear and simple for people, I'll just write it up here. You get fluent You get fluent when you know vocabulary extremely well, extremely well. <clears throat> and this can be a very quick process. So you can learn something and maybe you understand it right away the first time you hear it, uh, and then you could start using it in your, in your conversations. It would be very easy to do that. Uh, and so like me, as I'm learning new Japanese, this is how it is for me for many things. Some things, it takes more time uh, you know, to, to use that vocabulary. All right. But you get fluent when you know vocabulary extremely well. So I notice I don't say anything here about speaking practice or meeting native speakers or chat groups or anything like that. You get fluent when you know vocabulary really well. So if you don't feel confident about something, it means you don't feel confident about the usage or the vocabulary, or it could be many different things about that. But the point is you're, you're not, uh, you don't feel confident enough to use it and that's what's really stopping you from communicating. So it's not the amount of words that you know that helps you speak. It's helpful, but only if you know that vocabulary really well. So it's much better to learn something. You know a hundred words really well. You could easily have conversations about many different things. And so very quickly, if you follow this approach, you can get fluent like in days or weeks and then, and then have a, a good vocabulary that you can use to talk about many different things. So if you want to have conversations about lots of different things quickly, this is how you do it. I know it seems like Okay, we should, we should do the ESL way where we're trying to get like, you know, a thousand examples in a month. It's, not, it's better to do like 10 examples in, in a month or something or as really as long as you can understand exactly how they are. Uh, but it should be vocabulary you know very well. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, go back to... All right. I think I got all those. Hello, so I'm late and I don't have any idea of the topic. The topic is how to speak fluently about almost anything, and this is how you do it. So you just have to spend more time reviewing things uh, and making sure you really understand them. So anybody that's asking, how can I speak fluently, that's, that's how it is. So Mina, again, when I got in trouble in the pool, many people came out of the woodwork to help. Yeah. So you could say like lifeguards, lifeguards are coming out of the woodwork. Like I didn't notice them before, but wow, suddenly there are so many people around uh, to help me right now. Uh, hi everyone from the uh, USA. I prick, prick, prick. I maybe appreciate, appreciate you dear teacher for your practical live lessons. Glad to hear it. Greetings from Sri Lanka, from Brazil, and my team loses today. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Got his own there. Could you recommend some American dramas for beginning ESL student and intermediate ESL student? Uh, hmm. most, most TV shows like that are going to be more difficult than, than kids would be able to understand. I would recommend actually watching kids' shows rather than uh, trying to watch like a TV drama. I know it might be more interesting, but you will spend a lot of time 
trying to understand the vocabulary and there's very little review in that. You have a story and then you go on to the next story. Sometimes uh, some of the same vocabulary will be used but often it's not so it's really difficult to review in that way. So I would stay away from that. Uh, even for like intermediate, uh, intermediate learners it's better for them to, to really understand at least like 80 uh, 80 to 90 percent of the vocabulary in a TV show or a cartoon or whatever or a book uh, to make sure that they can learn new things in context. So you don't want to make it like, okay, you only understand half of it. Imagine trying to read a book and you only understand half of the words. That's going to be a very bad learning experience. Uh, you won't understand most things and you have to look in a dictionary and it just destroys the atmosphere of the book. So really you should know 80 to 90 percent because if you have a, a sentence with you know five words in it and you know four out of five of those you can understand that last word pretty easily from from the context of the sentence or the the context of the paragraph or whatever <clears throat> so i would recommend like uh stuff for kids i don't know what's what's popular now though for, for English stuff. I actually don't recommend even Boss Baby. My, my, my own kids should not be watching that show uh, just because it's, it's, it's way too difficult for them, but they're, they're picking up lots of, uh, lots of interesting, uh, interesting phrases. Uh, tell us about the story when you got the scar on your chin. <laughs> so I have, if you look, see here, it might be hard to see, but there are two scars Two scars on my chin. I think I told this story maybe at least in a lesson or in another YouTube video, but I can tell it very quickly again. Uh, that review is important. So the first one came from my older sister uh, who was holding me and she was swinging me around. Uh, like just, I think, I think holding me by my hands. Maybe it was holding me by my feet. That seems like a little bit uh, easier for the story, but she was just like swinging me around like this turning around really fast and swinging me. Uh, and she let me go and I went flying and I hit uh, like a windowsill and split my chin open. So that's the first scar. The second scar is from my younger sister. <laughs> so I was climbing out of a pool and she just like pushed my head back down onto the pool. <laughs> and I cracked my chin open again. I split it open. I split my chin open. All right, so now I have two scars, one from each sister on my chin. All right, so if you're listening carefully, you've learned, ah, you can say split open, like to, to cut something like that, to split it open. Uh, some very good vocabulary there. All right, uh, me and you, even if I learn one important vocabulary sentence of your class is good for me. Yeah, again, take, take your time. There's no rush to try to learn a whole bunch of things if you, if you don't feel confident in using them. So every day, if you could feel like fluent, if you could become fluent in one new word or phrase every day, you would feel very confident in a month. You would be like, wow, I, like now I can say a whole bunch of things and your improvement, uh, it accelerates over time. So it starts getting faster. You make progress faster as you start learning that way. So I know it seems like, wow, it seems like you're learning a lot if you try to learn a hundred phrases in one day. It seems like you're learning a lot. But because you will forget, uh, you will forget most of this vocabulary. So look, you just spent all that time and now you only remember one thing, but you still don't feel very confident about it. You're thinking, okay, is the pronunciation correct? Is the usage correct? Uh, or maybe the grammar or whatever. Uh, and so in, in these situations, you're really wasting your time. It seems like you're learning a lot, but if you forget all the vocabulary, you're just wasting your time. But here, we know we're learning, we can actually feel it, and you don't forget the vocabulary. So you hear many different examples, like the word harsh earlier today. So maybe today when I come back home, I will use, I will intentionally review the word harsh with Aria in, uh, in some natural way. So I might say, yeah, it was a, I was walking home and I forgot my sunglasses. The sun was really harsh. It was really harsh sun on my eyes. And then, like without her saying anything, even if she doesn't say the word, she's thinking automatically like, ah, oh, like, okay, another example of harsh, okay? So I was, I was uh, like washing my hands after, uh, after dinner, I was doing the dishes, uh, but I used the wrong soap. It was really harsh on my skin. It was really harsh on my skin. 
and so it was kind of uh, rubbing my rubbing my skin badly and making my skin cracked. So I split some of my skin like split open again that same split open. You see what I'm doing? How I'm reviewing the vocabulary naturally in context. Mm -hmm. All right. So when you're thinking about this again, if your issue is you understand but you don't speak. Uh, I talked to another in, in another recent video about the three levels of fluency or the three stages of fluency, how it works. So you begin by just being exposed to something. So my younger daughter or my older daughter, Aria, hears the word uh, like, I don't know, she hears the word uh, harsh. Okay, so we use that same example, more review. So she hears the word harsh in, uh, in a TV show. She's just being exposed to the word but she doesn't really understand what that means. And so she asks me again, dad, what does harsh mean? And so now we're, we're moving from exposure to awareness where now she can recognize the word because I've given her some more examples of it. And then when she is feeling like finally confident enough because I've given her enough examples or she heard them from other places, she heard harsh, like don't be so harsh, like be kind to people, don't be so harsh. Uh, don't judge people so harshly or the weather is harsh or the sun is harsh. After she hears all those, then she will feel very confident about using that uh, in her conversations. All right. So Mina says, I've been listening to you for more than uh, 10 years. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Hopefully I've been improving your English in that time. <laughs> Hopefully. All right. Let's see here. All right. Noel again. Hello. Uh, thank you. I learned how to improve my English. Glad you're here. How's your daughter? Yeah, both of them are doing well. Uh, maybe I'll get Noel in a video. That's my younger daughter. I don't think she has ever been in a video before. Thanks for this wonderful class. Glad to hear it. When I finish my uh, finish my money, many friends came out of the woodwork and helped me. Yes, that's a good example right there. So like people, when I, I was when I was broke, many people came out of the woodwork. So I was not expecting people to help me, uh, but when people heard I had no money, they came out of the woodwork. Like people came out of the woodwork to help me. All right, good usage. And again, uh, don't feel bad if you don't get something the first time. Remember, like, if I just say the word harsh, the word harsh, like vocabulary by itself, doesn't mean anything. It's only when you're hearing it in context connect, connected with some kind of situation. That's why it's important to learn vocabulary in context and really understand it rather than trying to connect it with a translation. Okay? So I hear like harsh weather. Uh, I had like a really harsh time at school. Like it was really like the class was really difficult. All right. So I can use lots of different examples of that. And as you get more examples, this is where you really feel strong about that, vo about that vocabulary. All right. Uh, let's see here. All right. How to watch movies and TV shows to increase listening and speaking. Uh, again, the, the best thing to do is really to, to focus on something. I would not, I mean, I know like people want to watch TV shows. Let me, let me draw this and make an even like easier way of explaining this. All right, so th this is, hopefully this will make sense to people. You hear me using this expression again and again. Hopefully this is understandable. Uh, this is our uh, English student right here. So someone who wants to learn the language. Uh, the goal over here, uh, let's say the goal, uh, is to understand the TV shows uh, and conversations or whatever. Uh, and so what people think they do, we're going to put a line here. There's an E... Uh, SL, so English as a second language, uh, they're trying to go directly here. They're trying to go directly uh, to this vocabulary. Uh, and so in the ESL approach, we go directly, let me, let me draw a different line here, make this a little bit easier to understand. So this is, so we're going to contrast these two methods here, trying to get to this, trying to get to this goal over here. So to enjoy conversations, movies, TV shows, or you know all of that kind of stuff, just regular everyday life. And they want to go there, but because they try to go directly, they never reach this. It's like this, this just, it's what they, what they think they're doing is like they're getting to the goal, but what's really happening is they're kind of, they're going like around in a circle like this. 
So it looks like they're they're making progress, but but really they're just learning more vocabulary, but not actually becoming fluent in that vocabulary. Okay, and so it's for the EFL approach. So English as a first language. What's happening is like you're you're kind of taking like a slow a slow step each day as you build up your vocabulary and you really become fluent in that. So it seems like this is like the faster way. It seems like it's faster. Uh, but the problem is you're moving faster because you keep getting like all this new vocabulary, but you're not actually fluent in it. All right. So you can keep, you just go faster and faster and faster, but aren't actually getting closer to the goal. But in the English as a, and this is the same thing natives are doing here. They spend more time learning things and, and over time this like it accelerates and gets much faster. And this is how you get to to understanding TV shows and music and movies and having conversations, that kind of thing. It's because they spend a lot of time really understanding vocabulary very well. So at first, it seems like a slow process. So if we imagine like on day one, uh, so the English as a second language person has learned, or I mean they had a class about, let's say like 10 words. But the EFL approach was only just one. Okay, on, the, on day two, they learn like 10 more. And on day two over here, it's, you know, they're on the second word or phrase. So it seems like the EFL approach is, is moving more slowly, all right? But the problem is they're, they're never going to get over here by doing this approach. It's only going to have them just go faster and faster as they try to learn more vocabulary the traditional way. But they don't actually become fluent in that, so they never reach this. Okay, so the only way to get this is to become fluent in individual words and phrases. If you don't become fluent here and here and here, then of course you will not be able to do this. But if you get fluent in this word and you get fluent in this word and fluent in this word and this word, then of course you will have great conversations. Okay, as I, as I often say, uh, like people think about getting fluent in English or in Japanese, or in French, or in German, or whatever the language is. So they think about and they talk about getting fluent in a language, when what's really happening is you're getting fluent in vocabulary. You get fluent in a grammar point, and you really understand pronunciation, uh, but you get all that like one thing at a time. And this is why, like even some ESL students, like they will be fluent in some things, but not others. So they can have a conversation or speak maybe about work because they've talked about those things so many times. So this is not about trying to watch a particular movie or TV show. Uh, instead of doing that, it's much better to find something you can focus on that's like a shorter, easier thing, uh, like, you know, like watching a YouTube video about, about doing something you're interested in, like growing roses or something. So I give these examples. In this one, like we would watch, you know, on one day, we would watch four or five videos just, just talking about one topic, like how to, how to break, uh, I don't know, how to, how to make bread or something. All right. So here, like if we're going to contrast these two examples again, the English as a second language approach is learning about baking. They're learning all this like vocabulary about, about baking stuff, but they're not actually getting fluent in being able to talk about baking. <laughs> okay. So the, the difference here is like, if you get fluent in, uh, in each one of these things, then of course you get, you get over here to the goal. Why wouldn't you? You're getting fluent. If you get fluent in each of the pieces, then of course you get fluent in the whole. All right. But I don't know Korean. <laughs> you have to teach, tell me what that, tell me what that means. Uh, hopefully this makes sense though. So when you're looking for like a TV show, what will happen if you watch a TV show is you will learn, you will get a lot of vocabulary and then you will not be fluent in most of it. And so you will be able to understand, but it will not really improve your conversations. You really have to take time and focus on things. Uh, and that's why like what we do in Fluent for Life uh, is we will have one conversation. You're focusing on a single conversation for a month. Think about that. Most people are like, well, that's crazy. You can't focus on one conversation for a whole month. Why not? Think about the, the opposite of that. We're going to try to learn like a whole conversation in one day. That seems like the ridiculous thing to me. We're going we're gonna to try to like go through a whole TV show in one day? Really? 
I would take, I mean, if you're going to learn with a TV show, at least spend like the whole day, like, you know, like learning about that. All right. You need to get the review to really understand the vocabulary. If you can understand everything right when you're learning it, that's fantastic. Most people are not able to do that because the language just isn't understandable or you don't quite understand a joke or something like that. So instead of trying to learn a bunch of things and not really understand them, it's much better uh, to focus on something and do that. So if you want to watch a TV show or something, really take time, like a whole week, and just focus on one episode, review it in different ways, watch YouTube videos of people talking about that episode. You really want to get lots of input about that same episode. All right, I've got some more good questions over here. All right. Puma says, you are the best teacher. You are too kind over there. All right, uh, let's see. I went to school like a year ago, unknown how to write or read, but knew some spoken English grammar. F me up in my fluency. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to hear that, but that's typical. Yes, that's, that's basically how most people do it. But now my comprehension is much better. My classmates knew grammar, yeah. Thank you, I understand 95% of your speech. Glad to hear it, Felix. Uh, yeah, and so again, their spoken English was bad. And so, and I think that's what you mean uh, by bad. Uh, but yes, if you're, if you're learning, if you, if you focus on the same thing and really master it, that's, that's why I called originally uh, the name of the lesson sets in Fluent for Life are called Master English Conversation because that was the whole point. It was to develop mastery, to develop fluency about that. Uh, and so many people will know the rules English as a second language students will often know the rules about something, but they can't actually apply those rules in real conversations. Uh, even I've joined the English club, attended English speaking class, but my English still stuck. Can you help me with the good method? Is that able to approve well? Yes, so everything I'm talking about in this video uh, is explaining about that. Remember, uh, speaking, it, it, I know it seems like a crazy idea. It seems the opposite of what you should do, but speaking is not how you get fluent, all right? You get fluent by understanding something really well. All right. So you don't have to uh, like spend time meeting people or going to I don't know a speaking practice event or or trying to like try to spend any of your time doing that. It's much better if you and I, I made a whole video about this. If you go to the YouTube channel and look up, uh, if you only have 15 minutes a day to learn English, do this. And the, the basic idea of that is that it's much better to, to spend your time getting lots of examples of something so you really understand it rather than trying to uh, learn things a traditional way. All right. So ESL is English as a second language. I'll just put this uh, second. So English as a second language. Uh, and this is English as a first, first language. So we'll just put second up here and first down here. All right. So when you're learning English as a second language, it means that you think there's like a second language. So we have to learn it in a new way rather than learning it uh, just as like a language we would learn like our native language. And so the truth is, if you learn it like you learn your first language, you become fluent in that language. It doesn't matter. All right. I have another video on the channel that's talking about uh, like the truth about second languages and why there's no such thing as a second language. All right. So for me, there is no such thing as a second language. There are different languages like French and German and Italian, uh, but how you learn them is the important thing. So if you learn them like it's a, like a second language, like you're learning through your native language, that's what will stop you from speaking. But if you learn it as a first language and you understand everything, which is what this is, that's how you become fluent in that vocabulary. All right. So you don't need to spend time speaking with people. If you only have 15 minutes a day, just get lots of input. You will automatically feel more fluent because you can, you'll feel, uh, you will understand the, uh, the vocabulary much better. And then again, your, your improvement accelerates. I know that this is like, it looks opposite or whatever, but the point is we get to the goal faster over here where these uh, most English as a second language learners, they can be trapped in this for years. Okay, so they can be stuck going around and around, just learning more words, more words, more words, but they never get closer to fluency. That's why this happens. It's because they, they're, they're, if each one of these words that you learn, if you're not fluent in each of these things, then of course you won't be fluent over here. You can't reach that goal. But for here, like if I get fluent in one word, 
And then I get fluent in another word, and another word, and another word, like, of course I become fluent. Okay? All right, maybe I'm, I'm taking my, ex, my explanations are going too long over here. Uh, thanks for doing the class live list of streams. It helps me a lot. Glad here. I watch English TV shows so much in my child when my teacher asked me, uh, can you tell me the rules in this line? I don't know what that means. I love your way of instant visual explanation, and they work. Glad here. Me. Thanks. Ah. Oh. All right, there's that sneeze from half an hour ago. <laughs> All right, me, I've watched it, but I don't know why it happens. I don't know what that's referring to. Thanks for the excellent explanation. Uh, is this the same theory as Stephen crashing? Yes. Uh, so he discovered the same thing I did and before I was born. So he, he found uh, that you get fluent by getting comprehensible input in a low stress environment. So meaning that like if you, if you feel nervous, if you're in a classroom and your teacher is like, okay, stand up in front of the class and repeat something, then of course your language learning will be hurt as a result. Uh, so what you should be doing is actually not speaking at all. And that's the same thing Crash and recommends. Uh, so the same thing I discovered, the way I discovered it was after failing to learn different languages for 15 years uh, and then living in Japan and then I just, at a park, I just started paying attention to what uh, kids were doing and how they were talking with their parents. So you got Japanese kids speaking with their parents uh, and it's like, oh, look at that. Like they're not learning Japanese through English. They're learning Japanese in Japanese. It's just the first language for them. So if I learn Japanese as a first language, then I become fluent and that's what happened. Uh, and so it's the same thing. That's why I teach English as a first language rather than teaching it as a second language. Now, I could probably be more popular on YouTube if I made Japanese videos like for Japanese learners, but the problem is it would not help them speak. <laughs> and so I like, again, I have to think about that as a, as a teacher. Like if I just want to get more clicks and more views on my videos, there's other things I could do, but it makes it worse for the learning. So I'm always trying to figure out, obviously I would love to have more people watching videos, but I want to make sure people can actually benefit from them. All right. Uh, let's see see here. Uh, all right. So in my experience, I have enhanced my English by learning words in context and know how to use them in a phrase. I still have a lot to improve though. Yeah, great work, Henry, but that, that's what you should be doing. Determination motivation is really important for learning English. Yes, uh, but the most important thing is making sure you do the right thing. So you can feel very uh, motivated and still try to do the ESL approach and like you're still likely going to fail at doing that. Rustam says, I usually watch YouTube about homeless people. They had interviews and you can learn from their experiences and learn a lot of vocabulary. Yeah. So again, if you focus on like, if I'm just watching videos about homeless people or whatever, you pick a topic and you focus on that, of course, you're going to become a much better speaker because you will understand the language better. What should I do if I don't have anyone to talk with while learning as your method? Yes, for this, you, the, the whole point is not to speak with people. <laughs> I know it sounds weird. People are like, well, how do I speak? Where do I speak? Like, why are you worrying about speaking? If you don't really understand what you're saying, then don't talk. The point is just to sit and listen until you feel like, wow, like I really, really feel very good. All right. I'll give you another, another like contrast these examples over here. <clears throat> Again, we will contrast uh, the English as a second language approach versus the English uh, as a first language approach. And what people think they're doing, so in a typical class, uh, you will spend, <clears throat> if, we, uh, if we just split up uh, like, understanding down here we'll put a u for this uh and then uh actually it's kind of a bad little here <laughs> this is a bad oh my goodness i can't even draw a little bracket looking thing all right we'll just say uh here 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 okay and then this one is like here, here. okay all right so in the esl approach what you're doing is like you spend very little time trying to understand what you're learning and this is why teachers are using uh, like phrase books and translations and dictionary definitions and things like that, explanations about grammar that make the language more difficult. All right. So it's very little spent time uh, on understanding. The rest of it is like, okay, now class, I want you to speak. <laughs> 
It doesn't make any sense. It, it's, this is a crazy way to teach languages because number one, uh, it's demotivational, all right? You don't understand. If you don't understand, why would you try to speak? The people are like, okay, I gotta, now I gotta try to speak. The teacher says, okay, like here's a, here's a language. Uh, we're going to teach you, uh, like I'll teach you a word, like here's a, I don't know, a Japanese word uh, equals uh, this word in English. All right. The teacher didn't teach anything. They didn't actually help you understand anything. They're just giving you a definition. So this is, again, uh, understanding is like the lesson of that. And so the rest of the time, it's, it's just up to the student like, hey, why don't you speak? Now, now go out and try to use that. But the student is like, uh, I don't understand what I'm saying. And there are lots of reasons why they struggle to speak. Part of it is that the real language that natives use in real conversations is different from what they're learning in the classroom. All right, that's just one example. Uh, but the point is, this is what it looks like for ESL. Now, if this is what it looks like for ESL, for English as a second language, what do you think it looks like for the EFL student? What do you think is happening? Now, if you've been following this video, it should probably be pretty obvious. We're going to do the exact opposite, the exact opposite, look at this. We're gonna spend most of our time on understanding. And then really the fluent speech just comes out automatically at the end, all right? So we don't, we don't wanna just like help you understand a little bit. We wanna really, really help you understand a lot. Just like we gave that example of harsh. So the example for ESL, we learn a, a word like harsh, uh, like if we do it in Japanese, it's like, ah, kibishi ne, kibishi uh, to harsh. So we're going to just like translate something like that. Uh, and we're not going to spend much time using it in different examples. So if you learn this, like I guarantee you, if, you, if you're in an English classroom, uh, the first context that you learn that in is what you think it is. So if you learn harsh weather, then you will think harsh is only about weather. Okay. Harsh weather. So the teacher says harsh weather. Wow, a lot of harsh, harsh weather today. Okay, so the student thinks, okay, harsh must be connected to weather because they only get one example of that. They only think, okay, harsh, it's like, yeah, I understand maybe it's kind of bad. But in a real conversation, they might hear like harsh words. And suddenly they're like, uh, what? I thought it was about weather. And like after they learn, like, no, 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 it's not like harsh doesn't mean weather. It's just talking about something is, is difficult, it's frustrating, it's maybe like grating on you somehow. But that's what you get over here. So we're going to learn harsh, harsh words, harsh weather, harsh, uh, like harsh environment, a harsh storm, uh, harsh language, if you're yelling or cursing at someone. And then by the end, it's just like, ah. You know, you know harsh very well, boom, it just comes out automatically, all right? So think about it like, again, it's, it's the exact opposite of what people would be doing in a, in a regular classroom, but this is why people struggle to speak over here. It's because they don't understand what they're talking about. <clears throat> so of course they can't use it fluently, all right? So you don't have to feel bad if like, it's like, oh, like why, why can't I speak? It's because you don't understand what you're saying, okay? <clears throat> All right. Hopefully that makes sense. I keep trying to explain this in different ways about the different ways people are learning. Uh, but what this shows is like the actual speaking part is a very small part of the language learning process. All right. The, and that's why, and, and again, uh, Stephen Krashen discovered the same thing. Amazing, right? Like another person discovered the same thing about this. And it's pretty obvious because it's how we all get fluent in our native language. So if you spend your time understanding something, you really feel confident, then when it's time to speak, the words just come out. Now at this point, maybe, yeah, okay, you wanna like practice your, I don't know, like how your mouth moves or something. But if you've heard a hundred examples of something from different speakers, I'm pretty sure you would use something automatically the first time you had to say it. So the goal is not to speak, it's not to try to understand and, and, like, and, then, and then like quickly start speaking. You want to spend a lot of time, you just relax, start getting all that input. And this is exactly what we do in Fluent for Life. This is why we structure the program the way it is. Because we really want to help people understand something. The first time you hear it, you might not feel very confident about it. 
that's okay. We're going to teach it to you again. You're going to hear it again in a different way. You're going to hear a different speaker say it, all of these things. And then when you start using it in conversations, you will feel a lot better about it. All right. But you don't get there from here. Speaking is not what you need. It's not more speech. All right. <clears throat> all right. All right. Uh, okay, so hopefully that answered that question from Felix. Yes, so don't look for people to speak with. Just spend more time getting input. That's what you need. And that should, that's easy, right? That's all you have to do. You can get input anywhere, like YouTube or whatever. Uh, how can I do to have good speaking and become fluent in English? Thank you in advance. Yes, Muhammad, that's exactly what I covered in this video. Watch this video again. Very important, and I'm explaining this in different ways. And make sure people understand that. Dr. I, I move. Let's see. Thank you so much for your classes. My pleasure. Uh, I've watched tons of your videos, Master, and become familiar with your speeches. My question is how you evaluate my level if I'm able to understand 100% of your lessons. Uh, and uh, as I talk about in other videos, I talk about um, the, the seven fluency habits. And so you can, you can break down your ability to communicate or your English level uh, based on different skills. So your understanding might be strong, uh, but you could have really poor speech. All right. And again, like because we can look at these as, as different skills. So some people like their pronunciation is really good, but they don't know many words. OK, so we're not we can't really give an overall uh, value of your speech. Really, the the overall fluency is is judged by your weakest communication skill. So if you know a whole bunch of vocabulary, uh, but you don't feel confident using it, your confidence is limiting you. So you need to build that up first. Uh, before you start trying to speak. Uh, can I do that by repeating a movie again and again? Um, yeah, so I, I would recommend, again, a movie is, is really too long. I would, it's much better to, to focus on something short, like 15 minutes, half an hour at the most. Uh, so movies are going to be too long and it's going to be too difficult. I would, I would focus on a scene from a movie if you want to do that. Uh, but really like a, a very good way uh, even better than just repetition. So watching the same movie again is helpful and you will learn things from that and you will notice new things that you didn't find before. Like new vocabulary will be coming out of the woodwork, be coming out of the woodwork. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, if instead you watch different content about the same thing, uh, then you will learn a lot more much faster. So like you, you watch five different YouTube videos about I don't know, peeling a banana, even something as simple as that. How do we peel a banana? If you watch 10 different people talk about peeling a banana, you will learn a lot of vocabulary and you will feel very confident about that. And you will also be able to take that vocabulary and use it for much more uh, than just peeling bananas. Uh, I do need to learn with Google translation or image. Yes, Google image search is great. Uh, thank you for your work, Drew, says uh, Slager. Got, uh, glad to hear it. Uh, can you recommend any phrase book or vocabulary books? Uh, I don't really recommend anything because it's just really finding something that you are interested in uh, and then focusing on that vocabulary. So whatever the vocabulary is for you, for your life, whatever you need to focus on. I listen to you and understand what you say, but when I listen to TV shows like Made in Chelsea, it's very difficult. What should I do? Uh, good question, Harold. So again, that's the same thing. Like the way I'm speaking is different from the way people speak in real conversations. And most people who are trying to teach the language are doing that to make, make sure they're understood. Uh, so what we do in, in Fluent for Life, uh, so we start people down here at this level that can understand like teacher English. Uh, and then we want to get you up to this level where it's, uh, the natives are. So it's really difficult for you to just jump to like from a teacher where you understand everything to a TV show where you don't understand everything. So what we do in Fluent for Life is we want to take you up in steps like that so that you can move from one to real actual conversational English. So that's how you, you basically have to go uh, from one step to the next to do that. All right, uh, do I need to learn with Google? Uh, or you don't need to learn with Google. No, the point, you should be learning with things you understand. I'm glad you were so patient with getting the same questions over and over again. Yes, again, like, uh, I, I, it's some people, they learn, they get like the uh, aha, the, I call it the aha moment when they understand how they should be doing something. Uh, but different people may need different examples for that. Uh, 
Uh, I learned 50 words each week in my class, but can't use even 10 of them. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that, that is, again, the, the, whole, the whole point of this is like, you know your way is working. Like if, you, if you're just like, I don't know how to learn, what should I be doing? If, if you can learn one word and get fluent in one word, uh, that's the method you should be using. But if you learn something and can't remember it, then don't do that anymore. If your goal is to speak and to understand and to remember the vocabulary, uh, this is it. So learning English as a first language rather than learning it as a second language. Uh, why some words are hard to acquire? Uh, that's a good question. It could be the vocabulary from uh, something else you already know. Uh, like I, I talk about this in how to remember any English word where you're, you're trying to make it a new... Uh, like a new compartment or a new category in your mind for vocabulary because like let's say I'm trying to learn Japanese I already have a word in my native native language that I know harsh uh, but I have to learn something and fit something in that for Japanese as well so that's like one reason why vocabulary is a little bit difficult there's already something in there uh, so we try to create a new category for that uh, and I, I've, I've already covered that uh, in many other videos uh, but some of it could be I mean, the basic idea is that you don't spend enough time with the vocabulary. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's uh, for individual vocabulary. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of different reasons, but usually it's just because you don't you don't learn it like a native. Uh, I said movies because I like it, or maybe you could watch some movies of the same topic. Yeah. So again, like you 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 will you will find like there is there is a little bit of sacrifice at the beginning of this. It's like, I want to watch movies. Remember, the ESL way is like, I quickly want to get to the goal of I want to watch movies. It's kind of like a young entrepreneur, like let's say a, like a, a 18 year old kid wants to start a business and their goal is to make a million dollars. They're like, wow, I really want to have a million dollars. And so they try some different things and, and within a month, if they don't make a million dollars, they're angry about that. <laughs> And it's like, well, you know, you should probably spend some more time and learn and focus on something rather than trying five different kinds of businesses or something like that. Everyone knows someone in their life that's like, okay, uh, on one day they're like trying this business and the next day they're trying this business and the next day they're trying a different thing. <laughs> it's like, of course, you're, you're not, it's the same way kids are, are, you know, like people are learning languages. It's like you spend one day on one word, another day on another word, and another day on completely different vocabulary. Of course, you're not going to remember it or become fluent in that. So the goal really is to, is to spend more time on stuff. Uh, if you enjoy vocabulary or you enjoy movies, whatever the thing is, that's great. But sometimes you need to take a step back from that uh, and, and focus on something where people might be talking about it. But if you really want to watch a movie, uh, you can go ahead. But just understand it will probably make the, the overall process slower. Um, but if you do watch a movie, then try to add other things into that, like reading the transcript of the movie, just listening to the movie sometime while you're walking around. Uh, or like watching YouTube videos, giving reviews of the movie, that kind of thing. Um, so that's how you're going to get, get fluent in that vocabulary. But you will be spending more time doing that. Uh, it's good to listen to audio books and put on the subtitles uh, in English to read. Uh, yes, but again, uh, like a movie and an audio book, like those are both really long things and it's hard to review them because you're not likely to watch them again or listen to them again. But if you have a five minute clip of something, like a five minute speech or a five minute you know, conversation between two people, you can really focus on that uh, and then become fluent in that much faster. And if you do that uh, even a few times, the next time you watch a movie, you will understand much more, okay? So I know the goal is to get movies, but you like don't go directly uh, for the movie. You wanna go kind of like in a roundabout way, but it actually gets you there faster, all right? Uh, I work with many people from India. Most of the time, it's very hard to understand them. This may affect my productivity. What do you think I should do? Uh, yeah, so that's common. You know, people are, if I speak with Japanese people who, who know some English, some of them, maybe their pronunciation will not be very good. Uh, some of them can speak very well. Uh, but again, yes, it, it, it could potentially hurt your progress. I would maybe spend more time talking with them or like, 
you know, an, an interesting thing you could read, you could, you, or you could, uh, in, an interesting thing you could do uh, is make kind of like a challenge. So if you have a few different people who are around you, write down a sentence in English, maybe something you've heard me speak, and just say like, hey, like, this is like, I'm trying to improve my listening or something like that. Like, don't make it about them. You make it about yourself and like, I'm trying to like, it's like just a kind of thing for you. And so if you have like five different people say that, you know, or read that thing, you will improve your pronunciation or you will improve your ability to hear them as well. Oh my goodness, run out of time. We've already been going for an hour and a half. Oh my goodness, an hour and a half over here. Uh, let's see, how can I speak better English? Uh, I explained that already. So this whole video, go back and watch it. I know some people are coming in late. Drew, I think your work is really advanced compared to other teachers. I've found limiting beliefs and the person's motivation play a huge role in his learning process. How do you deal with this? Yes, uh, so I talk about limiting beliefs uh, as well. And I don't know what you mean about my work being advanced. Uh, the, I'm actually trying to do the opposite and really simplify what most people think uh, they need. So learners, again, they will spend a lot of their time trying to get translations or grammar rules or something like that when it's really just just try to understand it like a native that's really the whole point uh, and the the limiting beliefs that people have uh, in my experience it's more about trying to get them to to learn in a new way so what's interesting about the english as a second language approach for me as a teacher uh, is that even though it's not getting students fluent they will continue to do it and this is like, this is like a, a thing that I, I spent a lot of time thinking about because if I can solve that problem, then I can help a lot more students. So again, if you, if you continue to do the English as a second language approach and it's not getting you fluent, then the first thing is just to stop doing that. And then it's easier to be open to, to new ways of learning. Uh, so if like for your whole life you've been told you need to speak to get fluent, and then I say, no, no, like speaking is actually a very small part of that. Uh, people are like, wow, that's, that's crazy. It's like, okay, well, if you don't believe me, that's fine. Uh, but we know for sure that the English as a second language approach is not going to help you. So it's already not helped you for years. Why would you continue doing this? And why would you not try something different? And so I, I recommend to people, that's why I try to give examples of how they, how they should be learning in, in all of my videos, um, like I did earlier. But sometimes I'm talking about you know, theory or what, what people should be doing as students. Uh, but this is it. So the, the limiting beliefs are more about, um, about how they should be learning and what they think they need. So they think they need a lot of vocabulary. They think they need to speak a lot when really they just need like a, a smaller vocabulary and less speech. So it, it, sh it should be like a really exciting idea for people. Like, wow, I can learn less and, uh, and, and I don't have to speak. I can actually improve my fluency without speaking. Yes, that's the idea. And it just, it just sounds unbelievable to people because they have been learning the traditional way for so long. Uh, so when, when you actually start learning this way, uh, you really don't have many troubles uh, with limiting beliefs because it's just easy to understand. So you can understand the vocabulary and you start using it and so you don't have lots of problems with confidence or other things like that. All of those problems come from learning English as a second language. All right. Yes, so try EFL. So again, like think about how you learn your native language. That's the exact same thing you're doing. All right. Uh, what are your thoughts on writing? Yeah, writing is a good idea. Uh, could it support and improve your speech and skills in any way? Yes, exactly. And this is why in Fluent for Life, people do some writing. Writing is good for slowing the language down. So when you really write something out, you can actually feel it. Like I recommend using uh, like a pen or pencil and paper. Uh, so you're actually writing down. I can give you, let me see here. Just to show you, like I practice what I preach. So this is a, look at this. So this is, this is a notebook of mine where I'm just practicing just writing down kanji. And I've got some uh, like examples of uh, like, it's kind of hard to read over here, but just writing down sentences just for the practice. All right, uh, let's see. 
Drew, my name is Diego Hi, from Venezuela. Is teaching English to a new learner helpful to learn uh, more oneself? Well, I, I don't quite understand the question. Is teaching English to a new learner helpful to learn more English oneself? Ah, okay. So, like, if you are teaching other people, yeah, I think. Well, if you if you feel very confident about what you're teaching, then yes, you will you will learn more about it. I think more of the. Uh, the, the responsibility you feel as a teacher, it motivates you to learn more. <laughs> you know, like me, if I want to teach something, I want to, I want to make sure I understand it very well. Uh, so that's a good way to do that. Uh, how to understand vocabulary without translating. So that just means you, you understand something. Go back and watch this video again. Uh, you'll learn more about how to do that. I hate ESL. I just follow uh, their book, Every Word They Want You to Use as they teach you the same meaning. Hmm. I notice native speakers use a lot of rising tone when speaking. Can you please expand a bit on that topic? Uh, it would depend, Millie, on the situation. I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but uh, most of the time it's in a situation it's, and it's better to look for that, pay attention for those kind of things. Uh, why English people invent phrasal verb? It makes English hard. Now, it's, they're, they're actually inventing phrasal verbs to make the language easier. But you have to think like a native speaker. Uh, it, go, watch my, my phrasal verb videos on my YouTube channel and you will see how easy it is. Uh, Hassan says, when I tried to listen to people talk, I understand most anything. But when I try to talk to people, I'm slow in response. Most of the time, I say the wrong thing, then realize that. What is your suggestion? Yeah. Learn English as a first language. <laughs> that's, that's my answer to, to basically everybody. And, and again, it's... It, 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 it's true in many different ways about listening and speaking and improving your pronunciation, all of that. Uh, as you understand better, you will communicate better. Harold says, do you have a video about how to use prepositions? Uh, yes, you could search the YouTube channel and also in uh, Fluent for Life. If you click on the link in the description below this video, um, it, will, it will explain more about that. We have whole, uh, whole lesson sets on prepositions. Adrian says, I just watched the movie, and if I hear new vocabulary, I pause the movie and use the subtitles to see the word or phrase, but only in that case I will use subtitles. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with using subtitles. I think subtitles are good uh, as long as you're not translating that. Uh, if you can, to try to learn it all in English is ideal. All right, so Salima says, yes, I'll try to e uh, try EFL more instead of ESL. Drew, you are, uh, you are it should be you are awesome. Uh, I started from scratch, glad to hear it. Uh, the bad of traditional English class that they, uh, instead of helping you to understand, they teach, uh, teach you rules, so you need to th learn rules as the professional that goes to the university. Yes. <laughs> and again, like, there's very little that you understand for using it in an actual conversation. It actually, it actually hurts your ability to communicate. How to start teaching speaking with beginning learners. Uh, let's see, watch my, uh, number one, download Frederick. Uh, so this is like a full like EFL uh, approach. So English as a first language. Uh, it's an app that people can use to teach themselves the language all in English. So they'll learn vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation without studying rules. So you can get that by clicking on the link in the description below this video. Uh, but if you'd like to see videos of me actually doing this, so teaching English to uh, to non-natives all in English. Go to the, uh, the playlist on my channel. It's called the Best Beginning English Playlist or something like that. But it's a series that goes from an absolute beginner uh, to higher level uh, like phrasal verbs and adverbs and things like that. Uh, I think to communicate, you don't need to focus learning grammar rules as a professional student. Yes. So the, the, the whole idea is that like you want to understand how to use the vocabulary, but you don't need to know like grammatical terms. So if I go to a native speaker and I say, can you give me an example of like the past simple? And it's like, okay, it should like most people would not be able to do that. Actually, they know noun, verb and adjective, maybe adjective. <laughs> most people know noun and verb. And that's it, all right, in their native language. Uh, let's see. Why are you learning Japanese? I think that language is so difficult. Yeah, I, I mean, again, like, I, I don't think about anything as like a second language. I don't rank languages by their difficulty either. Uh, I talked about this in another video um, where if you look at children, 
children learn to speak their language at basically the same age all over the world, whatever the language is. So it, that means that there isn't like one language that's more difficult than another. It's just how people teach. That's the, that's the whole the whole difference here. So I learned Japanese as a first language, just like Japanese kids learn Japanese as a first language. That's the same thing. Uh, so yes, I live in Japan. That's correct. Uh, can I recommend any website for EFL? Uh, well, just watch watch more videos on my channel because I'm I'm basically the only person who talks about this uh, with lessons specifically for learners. So everybody else is teaching English as a second language. So you will probably not even find much. We're trying to get more information on our site right now about that, uh, just to help people understand English as a first language. But if you watch all of the recent videos on my, on my even, well, even older videos on my channel, you will find lots of information about it. But it's really a very simple process. Uh, I think maybe next week I will do a video. Would that be helpful? Uh, like how to teach English as a first language? Would that be helpful? Let me know. Um, I think the best way to improve English is more listening, more phrases, don't focus on grammar. Yes, again, like the, the point is not to think about grammar or phrases or whatever because these are all things that naturally come together in the language. So you're, if you're learning English as a first language, then you don't have to worry about like, okay, I'm studying grammar rules or something like that. The point is you just understand it automatically, naturally. My students have the translating habit. I don't know how to fix that issue. Yes, uh, get, send, send us an, e an email at info at English anyone if you have questions, info at English anyone .com. Uh, But definitely try Frederick with them uh, and show them that beginning English playlist. You will see how I'm, how I'm teaching people that don't know any English. Uh, Drew, do you think it's okay to learn two languages or is it better to finish or getting a high level with one, uh, example, English and Portuguese? Um, I think if you can understand that thing, it's, it's the same thing as like learning English and learning to code for a computer. They're both languages that you're trying to learn. And so if you learn them, the difference is like um, uh, in, if you're trying to learn uh, like for, for coding or something, you would try to learn it. I mean, I, I'm not even going to go into how to teach coding, but it should work the same way that you're learning this. So you're kind of learning coding as a first language kind of. Like the ideal way for learning code is like you have a split screen computer, you type something in and then something changes on this side of the screen. So you can see like this thing does that, you know, you can see the, the, the opposite thing there. Uh, but it works the same way for learning English. All right, F Felix, again, uh, I feel more confident since I focused on your videos like one month ago. I'm using your method since that day. Glad to hear it. Uh, Demonio says hello from Brazil. Please put translations on Portuguese. Well, this is just a live video. We won't even have uh, subtitles for a few days, I think. <laughs> but yes, if you, I, I don't make translations for any of these videos, but uh, maybe I could. Maybe in the future we will do something. All right, I'm running out of time, uh, but hopefully people have enjoyed this video, and it looks like people have. I recommend you go back and watch it again. Uh, for the examples, I try to do examples of things when you're learning um, at the beginning. How would you approach unfamiliar sounds? Unfamiliar sounds. Uh, I don't have time to talk about sound transitioning, but if you want to listen for different sounds, get, uh, get Frederick. Just click on the link in the description so you will find information about Fluent for Life uh, and, uh, and Frederick uh, below, below, the, uh, below this video. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. Yes, uh, so send us an info at, send us a mail at info at englishanyone.com if you have any questions. Uh, but we had another, uh, we had some, some people, some teachers in Vietnam who were using Frederick and they said that was like the best thing they had ever tried for teaching phonics and pronunciation and things like that. So give it a try. Last year, a company recruiter told me or evaluated B2, but honestly, I feel like I'm between B1. That makes me feel hesitant. Likely you're probably good at some things and maybe less good in others. That's how that works. Uh, sorry, I don't know about the live screen. Uh, yes, I want to say thank you. Yes, I know you are commenting on a lot of our videos. And I know, I don't know, if Pawar, is that your first name or your last name? Ganshayam uh, Pawar. But yes, thank you for, for spending time and learning with us and supporting what we do. Thank you for the topic. Uh, it was an interesting topic, the way you have shown us. Have a good day. So EFL, can you repeat, teacher? I don't hire exactly what you're explaining. Yes, again, the point is to learn English the same way natives do. Uh, and you can actually just get lots of input, and that will help you become a fluent speaker. 
rather than trying to learn lots of rules and vocabulary and speak when you don't actually feel confident. All right, that's the basic idea. Uh, but I think maybe next week I will do a video um, if that will be helpful for people. Do you have intonation videos on YouTube? Uh, yes, you can look for so anything you want to look for, like just search our channel for pronunciation or intonation or whatever. Uh, all right, but I think that's it. I have to go now. That's the end of the video. But again, thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm glad you all have enjoyed this. If you're just getting late uh, to the video, I recommend you go back uh, and watch this again, uh, or at least you will learn a couple different examples of how this works. But I think maybe next time I will make a video specifically about like the principles of English as a first language, uh, so people have that. Oh no, please, sir. One last question, please, sir. Please, <laughs> Suresh, go ahead. What you got for me? Hurry up. Don't type. Don't tape. What, what, what you got here? Which English? Uh, which What should we do for for learning English? Go back and watch the video. It explains that and it answers your question. <laughs> All right, so go back. I know you're probably late to the party over here. Go back and watch the video, and it will make sure um, I explain it a couple different times in different ways. Have a fantastic day, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.